Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. And today uh, we are going to dive into a little known piece of pro sports and true crime um, nexus point that is a fascinating tale of when a up and coming pro boxer runs into the black mafia and the Italian mafia in Philadelphia and fate is not so kind. I want to bring on Sean Nam, one of the country's leading writers uh, of uh, the, the pro boxing game and somebody that has become an expert in the story we're about to tell and wrote a great book on it called Murder on Federal Street. Sean, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Scott. So, uh, let, you know, I'm just going to give a quick primer and then I want to throw it over to you to talk about how you got interested in the uh, case and, and t- talk us through your process and everything. So for people that might not know, uh, Philadelphia, one of the greatest boxing cities in the world, um, being a Detroiter, I you know grew up big boxing fan. We had the Kronk gym here. I grew up following Tommy the Hitman Hearns and all the great Kronk boxers. Obviously, if you go back even further, you got Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray Robinson, um, but, uh, Philadelphia, you know, is one of the, just, it, it's a breeding ground. It's so fertile for not just great fighters, but great punchers, guys that had a, a lot of power and, and were just brawlers. Um, interestingly enough, the guy we're going to talk about didn't really fit that mode. His name was Tyrone Everett. Uh, they called him the mean machine or, uh, Ty Ty butterfly or Ty the butterfly. Um, light uh, started off as a featherweight, ended up as a junior lightweight, and was a real big up and comer in the seventies. Um, and got a title shot, and controversial decision went against him. This was in late seventy six, and then within a couple months, he was dead, uh, murdered on Federal Street, which is a you know pretty iconic thoroughfare through certain part uh, through a certain certain part of Philadelphia that had a lot of black mafia presence. And um, there's still a lot of questions about why he was killed, how he was killed. His, his girlfriend shot him, caught him in bed with somebody, but it isn't maybe all that it meets the eye. So that's the, that's the quick primer and, and saying that uh, Tyrone Everett wasn't a big puncher. Uh, he was more of a guy that would try to win, fights on points. So he wasn't, you know, beloved by people that were trying to sell tickets necessarily. Sean, let's dive into it. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the interesting thing about Tyrone. Um, he was part of this really rich kind of culture of price fighting, uh, that had been kind of the, the, you know, um, the work of the promoter, J. Russell Peltz, Peltz is who's still around and, was really instrumental in kind of piecing, helping me piece together that kind of history. Um, and, you know, the, the bread and butter at the time was, you know, you meet in the center of the ring and you, you bash each other's brains out. I mean, that was what, that's why you went to a fight. You didn't want, you didn't go to a fight. You didn't pay for a ticket to see two guys dance around. Yeah. Um, that's a lot more common today. Look at Floyd Mayweather, man. Money and Mayweather. Accepted. Yeah, Mayweather became one of the highest gross, grossing fighter of all time. Yeah. Uh, Doesn't knock people out. And uh, But, you know, back in the day, you didn't have that kind of television uh, subs- subsidization. You didn't have uh, the kind of commercial framework. And so you had to appeal to the Tom Brown. Uh, and you got him to come to these fights uh, based on guys who like to punch and who could take a punch. Um, so I'm thinking of guys like Benny Briscoe, you know, who in a lot of ways, a lot of ways typifies the kind of hard nosed Philadelphia spirit, blue collar guy, you know, hard hat, you know, um, and so, some of my favorites were like Meldrick Taylor, Timmy Witherspoon, yeah, obviously later on, absolutely. Joe, Joe, Joe Frazier, obviously. Yeah, Joe Frazier. Yeah. And then Bernard, Bernard Hopkins is, you know, maybe the GOAT in that city. Absolutely, yeah. And so you could argue, like, you know, 
some of the richest kind of middleweight fights took place in that era uh, in the 70s. And Tyrone was not a middleweight. He was a lightweight, you know, fought at around 130 pounds. Uh, again, he was not a... Um, he was not an aggressive fighter, but he showed flashes of that uh, in some of his fights. He had power. He didn't like to use it too often. He was a defensive guy, and that drove his promoter nuts, you know, because he saw the potential. And what complicated this was the fact that he was actually insanely popular as a local guy. You know, uh, we talk if we talk records. You know, at one point he was the second highest earner in Philadelphia after Benny Briscoe. And uh, the title fight in which, you know, he was allegedly uh, cheated out of a victory, uh, that is still the highest uh, kind of indoor attendance for a prize fight in the state of Pennsylvania to this day. There's something like 16,000 plus uh, at the old Spectrum. And uh, it, was against, it was against Alfredo Escalera, right? Alfredo Escalera, yeah. From Puerto Rico. And it's yeah. interesting that we got that um, Tyrone got the title shot in Philadelphia as opposed to having to go to Puerto Rico to fight the champ Escalera. Yeah. And by that time, you know, Everett basically established himself as a draw. Uh, a draw. Yeah. And you could bring somebody like Escalera who, who, who fought on the road. So it was not new for him, you know, and he was kind of an itinerant guy who, uh, you know, fought in Japan and other places. Um, but, uh, yeah, Tyrone had this backing and this backing, you know, was from South Philadelphia. And, you know, there, you know, we'll get into the Black Mafia at some point, but, you know, uh, when I spoke to Peltz and, and, you know, there are other kind of news reports that would reference kind of the demographic of the crowd. And they were, you know, they were dressed to the nines, you know, uh, you think, think, uh, you know, think of your favorite black exploitation film. And you think of some of these, you know, really flashy kind of high rollers kind of coming through and, um, you know, Peltz, uh, told me you know, you know that was we we knew that everett had kind of his street uh uh affiliations and friends and they all showed up and you know they made a point of really supporting their guy and so you know uh it's not enough to say that he was a, a fighter who uh was talented he was a popular fighter and you know Think about the average price price fighter, and think about the th- think of it this way: you go to a Tyrone Everett fight, and you would hear women, uh, you know, cheering. You know, yeah. he was a la- known as a ladies' man. He which was makes- a ladies' man. He was a good-looking guy, right? Which makes his demise even stranger. We'll get into that in a second. Yeah. Uh, just for you know, the before we get into some of the meteor stuff, let's give some context. And, and you've already started to color it up, but in Philadelphia, in pro boxing at this time in the 70s, I mean, the mafia controlled the whole thing or virtually the whole thing. They had their um, claws into the different sanctioning bodies and different uh, uh, regulatory bodies. So in Philadelphia, you had some real famous gangster slash boxing puppeteers. Frankie Carbo, Blinky Palermo um, are two of the most legendary. And they were in the middle of some of this. Uh, and there was a guy named Tony, uh, Anthony Ferrante, who they call Tony Meats. He was a big mm-hmm. a boxing guy. And then I'm going to turn it over to you. you then you had the, the Philadelphia Black Mafia guys that worked with the Italians. But it seemed like from reading your book and from doing a little bit of due diligence on my part, it seemed like Tyrone Everett was dabbling on the side, fronting some of these Philly black mafia guys money for drug transactions and and so forth. So you had this milieu of criminality that kind of surrounded Tyrone Everett. Now, Sean, take it over. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, I would say that the, by by the time the seventies, 
rules around the so you're referencing the mob influence on boxing by after uh what is the early 60s after the key Alver uh senate hearings mm -hmm. it's considered that by that time you know the the organized crime groups uh uh that controlled boxing were basically gone but okay so this was, a, this was a time when there was they had lesser lesser if they were yeah influence. i mean by the time by the time uh by the time Tyrone comes up on the scene, Russell Pelt, you know, for somebody who's getting into boxing as a former journalist, he he thinks the mob is a thing of the past. You know, it's a, it's their, you know, it's what you see in film noirs. It's you know, that's a thing of the past. So, but is that true? But, I mean, it does. It kind of flies against some of my research that had the mafia involved all the way. I would but, say by the '90s they were out. But in the 70s yeah. and 80s, they might not have held the weight that they held up and through the 50s. And 60s. Exactly, exactly. And I think like the kind of um, the, maybe the broad stroke, the kind of uh, visibility that they had in any case um, wasn't as apparent. Yeah, pronounced. And, yeah. um, but you are right, though, that, uh, you know, F Frankie Carbo, obviously, but... Um, the main guy is Palermo, who who crawls back into boxing in the seventies, and yeah, I mentioned this title fight. That's where um, you know Peltz recalls seeing you know Palermo at the airport after the fight, and you know uh, there was a controversial judge in the fight who scored it against Tyrone, and he said you could buy this guy for a cup of coffee. Right. And you see another associate of Palermo, a um, guy named Honest Bill Daly, who was part of that whole syndicate back in the 50s, but he was not indicted. And he is also part of this picture. And so, yeah. Is this fight took the guns? Definitely not. Um, and in a lot of ways, it, it seems like they had their imprint um, on this title fight that um, a lot of people thought Tyrone won, but it didn't go, uh, it didn't go his way. The, should we, we should let people know the fight was on November 30th, 1976. It was, we said it was at the spectrum. It was for the WBC junior lightweight uh, championship belt, Alfredo Escalera versus Tyrone Everett, who at the time was undefeated. Yeah. Yeah. This was a week. Or two after the premiere of Rocky, right? Um, which is a kind of well, cool. It's, no, it's, it's noteworthy. It's noteworthy because it, it, it Rocky took place in Philadelphia. I can imagine that place was just. Uh, it, it already would have been buzzy, but you add the Rocky element into it. Yeah, the, the, you must have been able to cut the tension with the night. It must have been a lot. Yeah. yeah. So this happens, and 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 um, you know. Everybody's devastated. Pelts, uh, Tyrone's manager, Frank Gelb, um, who interestingly would later become kind of the head guy at Atlantic City for boxing fights when Atlantic City started uh, coming into the picture. Um, and they, they were just, you know, stunned. And uh, Pelts. At the time was, you know, he would admit that he was naive. He thought they had done their research on the judges. Uh, there was no way that the hometown judge would would score against Everett. It was kind of this wink-wink thing that you figured, okay, if, the, if it got close, you know, our guy would take care of us. It was you know, it's almost kind of an unwritten rule in boxing in a way. Um, but the fact is that Tyrone, if you look at the film, and I believe there's footage of it back up, back up on YouTube, it's pretty clearly uh, a win for him. You know, he kind of handled this guy the way that he uh, does best, which is kind of the box on the outside and, and you know, counter him. Uh, and so when, you know, after this kind of debacle, it's kind of, I think I call it a stain in kind of the Philadelphia boxing scene. And, you know, it's only six months later that, you know, he's found uh, on the second floor of his girlf girlfriend's house on Federal Street, uh, bloodied, 
bullet uh, rammed up his nose. Um, uh, he died within minutes, uh, according to the coronary report. So May you had 20, these, May 26, 1977. Yeah. Yeah. So you had these two kind of tragedies for a fighter who was all of 24, 23. Um, a lot of people thought might have had a good chance to make it to the Hall of Fame. You know, he's just getting started. Uh, he's one of those great what could have been stories. He's probably the fighter from the city of brotherly love that is the most legendary fighter that nobody knows about. Maybe, yeah. maybe even you know before becoming a legend, but had the trajectory to become a legend in a, a legendary fight city. Um, I talked to over the last couple of weeks, I've talked to a couple of people that, you know, you bring him up and, and if you're from Philadelphia, you, in your, in your boxing fan, you immediately know who he was. I didn't know who he was until I picked up Sean's book last year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's interesting that the notoriety that he had locally compared to what could have been on a national level, but it, it it's also, um, noteworthy to say that he won two fights after, the fight against Escalera. So in right. those six months, he actually fought again and won. And he had yeah. set up a rematch with Escalera. It was going to be in Puerto Rico. Right, right. And and that was to be promoted by Don King. Right. Um, who Just had gotten in control of yeah. Escalera at that point. Um, and so on one on, on one theory, the the uh, the fixed fight, if you will, uh, and for the title fight was a way for Don King to get into the picture who at the time was doing a lot of things in Puerto Rico. And, you know, um, it was like a battle between Don King and then you had Bob Arum, who was um, Ali's kind of first promoter um, or right. eventual promoter. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're not alone. I, you would, you know, I would talk to fighters. Uh, I would talk to, you know, so-called hardcore fans and this name was simply not registering you know and as, as i was going through my research you realize this guy was a big deal and if you were in boxing circles at the time there's no way you didn't know this guy um and that's and and, and again uh I, I start the book off painting a portrait of the funeral scene and it is complete chaos they're reported you know, several thousand people uh, kind of out in the streets, milling around, and um, you had all the bigwigs in town. You had Rizzo. You had... Frank Rizzo, the police chief. Yeah, you had Frank Rizzo. You had Joe Frazier. Um, you had some big, yeah, you had some big names come through and pay respect. Um, also, uh, Philadelphia Black Mafia guys were at the funeral. I imagine so. Yeah, I talked yeah. to some people. They said that there was. Oh, a... there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or maybe we need to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, I, I guess for your readers, I, you know, when I'm when I'm writing the story, I, I don't make the connection yet between this possible um, affiliation with the Black Mafia until later on. And when I do, that's when I realize, okay, we've got something here because we can bring something new to the table because the story about Tyrone Everett had always been, okay, uh, the streets got a hold of him. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't get out of the streets. He was like Hector Camacho. It was the same kind of circumstance. Um, and I always wondered, like, well, so what does that mean? What, 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 what did that entail? What, what, um, and so... The Black Mafia for me was an, a way to put kind of a face to this faceless entity. You know, um, there had been a lot of, I think, misconceptions about how he died, uh, that he was in bed necessarily with, with uh, another man. Um, and, and those are details that came out from the kind of prosecution from the defense side. Um, and and so I thought, okay, well, um, how did I stumble on this? Well, I think 
there are a couple of things. Uh, you know, uh, Ricardo McKendrick. Yeah, so that's um, let let people know that. Sorry to interrupt you, Sean. But no, no, no. I, if you want to, yeah. I mean, you probably know better than I do, Scott. I mean, Ricardo McKendrick is one of the kind of the chief figures right. of the Black Mafia, and uh, and he was a a real hard hitting enforcer type. This wasn't a. This was a guy that knew how to make money, but was also really feared. Yeah, uh, cutthroat. Ricardo cutthroat. McKendrick. They called him Ricky. Uh, some people called him, I think, Slick Rick or Big Rick. Yeah. Um, and he was like a, somebody that was in the inner circle with uh, Sam Christian and Ron Harvey, who were the founders um, of, of Black Mafia family. And when Sam Christian died at some point in the last 10 years, McKendrick, who's still around, you know, was one of his pallbearers. So this is mm. this is a guy that had his bona fides. Um, and McKendrick's, and again, I'm going to turn it back to Sean, but just to color it up for the audience, um, Tyrone Everett was known around town as a ladies' man, uh, dressed quite flashy, driving a Cadillac, a lot of different women on his arm. A after he died, there were rumors circulating based on the fact that the prosecutors were saying that he had been in some type of compromising posi uh, position with a man in the minutes before he was shot to death. Um, but there were some rumors that were going out that he had uh, possibly had some bisexual procl proclivities. Uh, yeah. But nonetheless, he was in a relationship at this point with Ricardo McKendrick's either wife or soon to be ex-wife. Mm -hmm. And it, it it potentially put them at quite serious odds. Now, go ahead. So. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, um, that was the kind of context that I've been missing. You know, there were, uh, there was a news report about how somebody what, during the trial was intimidating the chief witness, who's also alleged to have been, um, the man that he was in bed with um, was also Terry, the, Terry Price. The, His name was Terry Price. Exactly. Yes, and um, or, or yeah, um, and who had been under the employ of Carolyn McKendrick mm -hmm. to sell drugs. Um, all the drug stuff got swept under uh, the rug during the trial for prosecutorial reasons, but uh, that had always been like a kind of big tell like what what you know when, when they found tyrone in the home they found 39 uh carefully packaged yeah. um heroin packets of heroin yeah so this was not they weren't they weren't just you know um goofing around this was meant for distribution um but uh ricardo going back to ricardo so you know R R ricardo came up in the news again some 15 years ago, 15, maybe at this point, yeah. uh, nearly two decades, uh, for being involved in the, I think, what is still the biggest uh, cocaine bust in Philadelphia history. You, you might want to fact yeah, it was like, Yeah, it was like, well, that's what it was called at the time. It was like $200 million worth of, or, yeah. I mean, it was like 200 kilos, $200 million worth of drugs. It was, I'll, I'll get the specifics. But yeah, it was, and, it was and really, really. It was with his son, right? It was his son, of, Ricky Jr. Ricky Rick. Jr. And um, you know, I think one of the uh, reporters I saw, Kitty Caparella, who actually wrote yeah. some news stories uh, uh, on the Tyrone case um, back in the seventies, wrote an article on this drug bust and mentioned Carolyn McKendrick. I'm like, whoa, okay, and then. Um, you know, one thing 275 like, kilos. There you go. That yeah. is a huge, <laughs> that's a cartel like seizure from a, a, a property in Philadelphia. Yeah. So, and then one thing led to another, and I, I discover Ricardo in, in, in Sean Patrick Griffin's book, uh, Black Brothers Inc. Um, and that reading that book um, allowed me to 
piece together a lot, a lot more um, things. Uh, again, I was, I was, I'm kind of reading tea leaves at this point, um, but I felt I had enough context now to present this and potentially change and shape the way people have thought about this story. Um, and, you know, there have been follow-up stories over the years from various reporters who would attempt to do kind of a recap. Um, understandably, you know, it's, uh, you, know, you had the fixed fight and you had the, you had the slaying and the black mafia never came up. That term never came up, even right. though uh, it was uh, well known, I think, at least by law enforcement. Um, and that, they had done stories in several of the big papers in Philadelphia on the Black Mafia. Um, but, you know, decades later, this had all been kind of forgotten in a way. Um, and uh, again, I think if you look at the details of the case of, of Tyrone's involvement with potentially the, the wife of, a, you know, one of the leading members of really brutal criminal organization, really smart one as well. Uh, it's hard to look at this and be, be thinking, OK, um, maybe you weren't as immune and hot as you thought, you know, um, because, you know, Tyrone was feeling pretty good about himself at that, at that time. Um, but, you know, as one kind of source I was able to talk to in the book, uh, who was the son of one of the members of the Black Mafia, he said, just from an optics standpoint, it looked bad. Uh, you know, in the case, uh, the, the reason, uh, so Carolyn would end up doing, I think, about five years. I think she was sentenced to 10 Um but they were able to drop a lot of the charges uh, based on the fact that they had witnesses who uh, claimed to have seen Tyrone beat her in public and in private. And so let's say that's true. Um, if you're Ricardo and you're, and you're getting bits and pieces about how this hotshot boxer is messing around with your, not only messing around with your wife, but is, Pretty flam, pretty, pretty like not being shy about it. Exactly. He's out. <laughs> and, you know, how's that, how's that going to fly? So that's where, you know, by the time I speak to uh, Tyrone's younger brother, uh, Eddie, uh, it's clear that a lot of people believe that. Carolyn necessarily was not the murderer. Um, and if she was, she was just the trigger person. So that was a conspiracy that, um, or at least a theory, let's say, that a lot of people um, in the kind of South Philadelphia area, area believed at the time. And it's still something that um, Eddie subscribes to, to this day. Um, what What is your knowledge of I know I'm, I'm kind of jumping all over the place here but in the aftermath of the Escalera fight uh, let's say going into December 76 to the beginning of 77 is he making a fuss about this is is uh, Everett making a fuss or is he doing like a, a Rocky a, a um uh, Raging Bull, where he kind of knew he had to, as much as he was opposed to it, he knew he had to swallow the loss in a fixed fight in order to get the championship in the next fight. Yeah, it's interesting. It, you know, early on, it seems like he takes this pretty well. And he's pretty uh, placid, almost unusually so. But later on, um, there's a reporter, a guy named Tom Cushman, who's kind of the boxing beat writer for the Daily News at the time, a great writer, um, really chronicled that era um, extraordinarily well. And he brings up uh, a meeting that he had with Tyrone, I think the day before he, he died. 
and how Tyrone was basically um, uh, believed he thought there was a compromised judge in his in his locker room at the night of the fight, and, uh, and, and a quick switch was made from one judge to another, um, and it was clear that he was very still very upset. Um, and there's a different conversation that he had with his manager, Frank Gelb, where he tells Gelb, listen, um, sometimes you got to get, um, or I think he's relaying a conversation that he had with Gelb to somebody else. Basically, you know, you, you got to get dirty sometimes. And that Frank, you know, Frank is from uh, Winfield uh, suburbs, a really prosperous suburb uh, of Philadelphia. It's like you some things you're just not going to know and you have to get dirty and you have to kind of get into the streets and you have to kind of play them, whoever them is at their own game. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, indication that Tyrone is pretty cynical at this point and maybe thinks he needs to, I know, go, go to a different direction. Um, I know there was also a, um, some informant uh, chatter that uh, McKendrick was responsible for a number of, and again, this is all alleged. Uh, yeah, Ricard Ricardo McKendrick has not been charged or convicted of any homicides. Um, but that McKendrick was one of the people that were tasked with getting rid of not just enemies uh, of Philadelphia Black Mafia, but people within the Philadelphia Black Mafia power structure that maybe weren't towing the line. I know one of the guys that he's a top suspect in the hit was a guy named Bud. I think his name was George Abney. They called him Bo, Bo Abney, who was a Philadelphia Black Mafia shot caller. So this is a guy that had a, at least a history of being investigated for homicides. Right. And Ad Adney was a guy with his head cut off or something. Was that? Yeah. 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 So yeah. this is, the, you know, this is, this is, we, we've talked about it before on the show. We actually had Sean Patrick uh, on a couple weeks ago. I mean, this is the brutal of the, you know, definition of raw brutality when you were talking about the Philadelphia Black Mafia of the 70s and early 80s, there was nothing really romantic about it, the way that some of the stories of the Italians had always been in terms of consumption uh, from the public. This was like, you took all the pomp and circumstance out of the gangsterism and it's just like, like I said, raw, unadulterated, criminality and, and ruthlessness. Yeah. And I think that's why I thought it was so important to bring up this context because, because of the violence that they were capable of. I mean, the, your readers, uh, listeners probably know, uh, you know, the, the Hanafi massacre in DC. Yep. With Kareem, um, at Kareem, at Kareem Abdul Jabbar's yeah. property. Yeah. And the Dubrow furniture, uh, I think attempted fire. Um, yeah. Some of these, uh, you know, there was like, you know, they weren't trying to get money. You know, it was just the, the brutality was the point. Yeah. Right. Um, they were making, and, they were making statements with their behavior. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, my, I can read this quote to you. This is, uh, um, what Tyrone's brother told me, uh, or that he told, uh, yeah, that he told me, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's like messing with Scarface's girl or the Godfather's wife You're between two mafia families. They were vicious families. So, um, yeah, in fact, um, Carolyn's um, family, the, you know, uh, the Swint family was also pretty much um, heavily involved in kind of the underworld as well. Um, Yeah, so, the, yeah, the Bo, Bo Abney was a got his yeah he was decapitated uh, was a black mafia 
member feuding with another black mafia member. I believe it was Cadillac Tommy Farrington, who he was uh, supposed to, or supposedly had stolen some narcotics, um, either or drugs or money, and they were fighting over certain territory where they were dealing. Mm-hmm. It's 1974 murder, so this was two years before uh, Everett, but M- McKendrick was a top suspect in that. Never charged. Mm-hmm. Scott, are you aware of where McKendrick might be now? Uh, he's not dead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the So when I was talking to Sean Patrick, and he's the undisputed kind of godfather of this Absolutely. type of reporting. I mean, he, he contextualized all the reporting from the 70s that was very, you know, macro uh, and, you know, in the moment and, you know, almost 20 years later or 20 or more than 20 years later, he, he rolled out a book that was just, you know, it's the Bible when it comes to the, to studying the Philadelphia black mafia family. I, I just want to point out, I, I don't have this book um, in its current permutation without Sean's book. Yeah. He, he's the one who introduced me to all of this and helped me in my research on it. And he's been great. Uh, but I, I think we might diverge, me and Sean, um, in our theories from, let's say, the 80s for, or let's say from the late 80s forward. He, he um, or let me, let me back that up for a second, late 90s forward. He, 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 he's of the opinion, and again, I have I'm, just what I hear is a little bit different from what he hears. So I'm not saying I'm right or that he's wrong. I just, I'm pointing out that we have a little bit of a divergence here. He's kind of saying that, you know, JBM, which was the junior black mafia family, which were the, the young teenage gophers and errand boys and protégés of the original Philly black mafia in the seventies, when all those guys went to prison, Junior Black Mafia, led by these these guys that had been mentored by the Philly, Philly Black Mafia, popped up and became more of kind of like a just a crack or a, a crack distribution organization more than a fully formatted criminal enterprise. Um, but he kind of says that it, according to Sean, uh, according to Sean Patrick's research, he says that all of that activity really stopped after the JBM busts. And my research tells me, even though I'm not claiming that there's some giant hierarchical organization left, but I know from my reporting, from talking to, you know, frankly, top guys within the Philadelphia mafia, um, both black and Italian. Um, one, I don't have a problem telling you because he's dead and it's known that I uh, was trying to, at one point I was authoring his biography. Uh, it was uh, Ralph Natale um, was doing, who was the boss of the Philadelphia Mafia in the late 90s, sure. um, was was doing business with them until late in his uh, late in his reign run. So that puts it all the way up into the early 2000s, but I think there are still pockets and smaller crews tangentially connected to other crews mm. that are made up of old JBM guys and possibly some old Philly Black Mafia guys. And again, I don't think it's a some type of uh, vertically integrated organization where there's money flowing up and down, but there's still something there. And, and these guys work with the Italians in some, in some capacity. And I know that there were some points in the late nineties, early two thousands where there was some dust ups, mm. like potential, I don't want to say war, but there was one incident where um, some of the junior black mafia guys were upset with the Merlino guys and they rolled up on and Merlino's front porch. This and when was, was this? This was 98, 99, maybe early, early 99 before Joey went to prison. 
I, I wrote about it. I'll, I'll send it. I'll send it to you when you get off air. Yeah, my understanding. My understanding comes from Sean's research is that JBM or 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 the Black Mafia, I should say, that by the time it's the mid '80s, they're kind of completely defanged. And I right. Guess, and, and I'm and, saying my research doesn't necessarily yeah. jive with that. Could just be a timeline thing. It, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to. Again, I defer to Sean and guys like you who are more kind of boots on the ground than I am. But uh, and I and I guess some of it's semantical too. Like what can cons- what's considered defanged, what's considered an organ an operational organization. Right. If a bunch of guys from a previous organization are still operating together, are they an organization? Right. So it, it, I think some of it's semantical. But I know what I can say for sure is right at this very second in the 2020s, there are guys that were at least high ranking members of the junior black mafia that spend time at least socially with Joey Merlino and all of his boys. Mm. Uh, I hear there's some illegal activity going on in the background of that. Um, that's neither here nor there, I guess, but uh, Tracy Mason and Benny Goff and some of those other guys, they still hang out with Joey Marlino. And it, and they're sure. not shy about it. You go on social media, you can find pretty recent photos of Tracy Mason and, and Joey Marlino. Yeah, that must be a completely generational thing, though. The oh, yeah. I'm just, aspect, I'm just saying yeah. that it's not uh, – if people think that these, uh, you know, these groups are – are either gone or opposite or or, are not intersecting anymore Mm. or people from organizations that used to be aren't intersecting with other current functioning entities like the Merlino or or the, I should say the um, Scarfo Bruno crime family. uh, I think they're a mistake. Mm. But again, I, I would defer to Sean Patrick, uh, on, on most of this stuff. And I think mm-hmm. some of what I'm saying could just be timeline distortions, not necessarily that were, or semantical things, not necessarily right. that we're right, disagreeing right. at the core of the research. Right. But yes, I, well, like you said, it wasn't that long ago. I think it was 2008 that um, the McKendrick senior and junior got caught in that race. So it was 15 years or 16 years ago. Yeah, and my understanding was that they um, maybe struck a plea deal, um, and um, you know I, I mentioned in the book that I was able to track down Carolyn. Um, fortunately, we weren't able to have an actual conversation um, on the record for the book, um, but that's kind of in a way my white whale is to get that side finally. Um, so perhaps down the line um, but it is just fascinating how you know the, the, the this this group has kind of persisted for so long and, and transcend and po- at least in terms of culture yeah has transcended um, you know one thing I, I've never really written about but I know it's out there I might write something about it at some point but you know, Will Smith um, the Fresh Prince you know he was tied up relatively closely with a JBM boss named Bucky Davis. Um, Bucky got killed at the peak of the crack wars. Um, and what I have written about at, at length is that, you know, the you can trace a lot of the Philadelphia music scene in the seventies, the Philadelphia, the soul, the, the soul sound. Um, and a number of the, major Philadelphia R and B soul recording artists were linked business wise, not, not illegal business wise, but legal business wise leak linked to certain members of the uh, black mafia family. Mm. Or that's just, I should say not, not BMF, the Philadelphia black mafia, uh, specifically um, Bo Baines, who was a, a boss. 
<laughs> right, I think Bo is it Bo Baines who appears in the documentary. Um, Bo Baines is the one who took over from Sam and Ron. Okay. Um, and he was working at one of the um, record labels in Philadelphia that was ha that was handling some of the artists. Maybe Teddy Pendergrass was one of them. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize for missing out on some of the details here. I know one guy was, I think Stan the Man. Does that sound, own the, own the record label? I, I, I'm i sorry, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. But uh, these are uh, groups that have intertwined with, you know, pro sports and boxing and uh, music for quite a while. Yeah, actually, I asked Sean about that one time, the Pendergrass connection, because there's like an internet rumor that the Black Mafia was behind his death. Yeah, I don't believe that part of it, but I do yeah, believe that he was in doing some that. business with them, like in terms of the yeah. recording industry. I think he, he was saying that there's just, he, he never came up once in, in his, in, in the kind of the records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has, so, uh, but it is fast. It, it's just fascinating. It's, it's you know, in, in a lot of ways, um, very few people know about this organization, um, although I think it's um, definitely achieved some notoriety uh, at least the past couple of decades. It's called uh, Philly. It's called Philly Groove Records, and okay. the uh, owner of it was a guy named John Watson, who they called Stan the Man. And Stan the Man Watson had affiliations with the Black Mafia, uh, and and Bo Baines was close to him, and Bo Baines was high up at the uh, um, uh, record label. Um, I just want to read a, uh, a quote from the book, um, again, by a member of one of the Black Mafia founders um, or leading members who kind of grew up with Rick Jr. Um, and, and knew Ricardo McKendrick. Um, Rick was living in Federal Street basically as a single man. and That was a running joke. He had young women running in and out of his home because Junior had fixed up the place pretty nice. Little Rick put about $50,000 worth of renovation into the house. That's kind of like if you've ever seen the movie Coming to America. It was a beautiful <laughs> place when I saw the place around 90 <laughs> to 92. There was a spiral staircase, and we're talking about South Philly Row House. This is where Rick Sr. was living. So he had a little palace in the ghetto, essentially. Yeah. It's, a, it's like gold gold faucets in a in a place yeah. that barely has water. <laughs> and, yeah, I and believe I, that was I believe that was a home. So when the drug bust comes up, you know they find cash in this wasn't house. It, on, then, it was on Federal Street, right? Yeah, and, so and that, isn't that interesting that with that link forty exactly. years or you know 30, 40 years later? Yeah. Um. No, it's and then, fascinating, and there's so many things I want to know more about. Um, but you know, we'll have to see. You know, I know uh, here in Detroit, there there was a kind of a similar situation happening with Kronk. Um, not a lot, not a lot of people know about. Everybody knows about the legendary Kronk Jim and Manny Stewart and that he, mm. he uh, was able to produce, you know, the most amount of championship fighters from any trainer or um, gym. I think he put out 45 world champions or something. Um, and there was a lot of uh, Italian and black mob influence in Kronk. Uh, Manny Stewart was at the center of more than one uh, federal racketeering drug investigation mm. never uh never uh arrested or, or convicted but you know kind of like we're talking about with tyron everett and how that his fights would would attract that kind of crowd tommy hearns his entire entourage was murder row and ybi and mm. murder row and ybi at in Detroit was the equivalent of Philadelphia Black Mafia. So you can look at newspaper photos, even 
videos that you can find on YouTube of Tommy Hearns walking to the ring uh, in the late 70s through the 80s. And I can tell you, the people behind him, how many bodies they all have. Huh. Uh, so, he, you know, he was immersed in that that life as well. Um, and, and Kronk was – so what I'm saying is I think even though some of this stuff had, hadn't been reported or hasn't been reported or people don't know about it, I think this was going on in every major city, probably in every major gym to some degree. Yeah, I talk, you know, and I talked to last thing I'll say, and I, I want to get your comment on it. I talked to a lot of ex Kronk gym, uh, ex Kronk fighters, guys that sometimes held belts, and uh, a lot of these guys. It didn't matter how much money they were making as fighters; they were still investing money in in street activity. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I didn't know that about the crunk. Well, connection. Yeah. Again, I don't want to go down, <laughs> don't go down this rabbit yeah, hole, yeah, but Daryl, yeah, yeah. Daryl Chambers, uh, God rest his soul. Daryl dynamite chambers, um, major contender, uh, came up with Tommy Hearns and the whole crunk gym crew. He swallowed 25 years for Manny. And I got no problem saying that right now. He's dead. Manny's mm. dead. Um, <laughs> and uh, Daryl died last year. He only got about three or four years of freedom. But he was the scapegoat for the entire Kronk empire's dirty dealings. Um, they needed a scapegoat. And in uh, the early 90s, after 10 years of investigations into Manny and Tommy Stewart, or sorry, Manny Stewart and Tommy Hearns, they indicted three fighters uh, from Kronk, one of them being a very prominent middleweight champion, Donald, uh, the the, uh, Lone Star Cobra. Donald Curry. Curry. Yeah. And uh, Donald beat the case. Uh, The other co-defendant flipped and testified. And Daryl ended up refusing to give the feds what they wanted, which was Manny Stewart and Tommy Hearns. And he had stuff to give them. Um, and Chambers went and got sentenced to life in prison. And I, I helped, uh, you know, his campaign to get freedom and got out, lived uh, three or four years of freedom and then passed away of a heart attack last year. But mm. that, he is the poster child for when being a professional boxer dovetails with being a drug dealer and it goes wrong mm. just like tyrone everett could have been yeah yeah um so, yeah, yeah it's, it's, camacho it's, comes to mind as yeah. well it, it's funny the you, you talk about these kind of kind of the legacy of the black mafia that yeah you, you could maybe do a whole book just about their relationship with boxing yeah um do, uh, you know, Mike Tyson's wife, Kiki Spicer Ali, uh, is none other than the daughter of yet another high ranking black mafia member, uh, Shamsuddin Ali. Yeah. Who I think uh, in many ways was kind of the, the, the ideal black mafia member. He did the street work on one side and then he was dealing with and hobnobbing with kind of the politicos on the other. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I think he was also one of the pallbearers at Sam Christian's funeral with, mm. and there was wow. uh, some some surveillance uh, uh, of him and McKendrick at the funeral in sixteen in 2016, 15. Wow. Yeah. So man. lives today, man. Well, this was yeah. uh, this was awesome, Patrick. Let or Patrick. This is awesome, Sean. <laughs> no, I'm calling you Pat. Who's Patrick? Hey, I. Uh, I, I, I I was, I was, we were just talking about Sean Patrick. That's why I said. Yeah. Uh, so, Sean, tell me, uh, tell everybody where they can uh, pick up uh, the book and, and where they can read you and, and consume anything that you got coming up. Uh, well, the book, you can 
probably, you know, if you were requested with any local bookstore, you could get it. Um, they could get it for you. It's obviously on Amazon. Um, there are a few Barnes and Nobles in the kind of Philadelphia, New Jersey, and um, yeah, in, in that area. Um, I have a full listing. If you have a website for the book, it's just the title of the book, murder on federal street.com. Um, and that'll have links, uh, that'll take you to, um, to buy the book. Uh, I have like the only social media I use is Twitter or X, uh, which is my name, S C A N P A S B O N. Um, and, and yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, this was awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming Likewise. and share, no. sharing this. Uh, you know, we take pride here at the OG pod where, um, we want to get into the nooks and crannies and find all the diamonds in the rough in terms of storytelling. And I, I love say this, it. Yeah. I love the nooks. I love the crannies. I, I say all this time. Yeah. I say all the time and I, and I know that these are cottage industries and I can only read so much about John Gotti, Al Capone, and Whitey Bulger. <laughs> so, like, those three people seem to take up all the oxygen in the room when it comes to telling sure. this kind of, and sure. I, I just, there's so many great stories like this. And thank you for coming on the OG and sharing it and talking boxing and talking Philadelphia and Italian mob, black mob. This is my sweet spot. I love it. Anytime. Thank you, sir. You're always welcome back on. And, uh, I'll uh, we'll, we'll uh, exchange uh, contacts and I'll, I'll uh, geek out with uh, some of my boxing knowledge with you awesome. <laughs> in, in the near forward. future. All right. Thank All right, you, Sean. Uh, thank you. For Benny Behind the Glass, thank you for producing. And for everybody that likes OG Pod and uh, Gangster Report, our, uh, our uh, companion web magazine, please spread the word, uh, share, like, subscribe, and we will keep – bringing you the great true crime content that you expect. For Sean and Benny, Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, out.